Tonight's top EU stories from the unit website include Village of Stilton is banned from making cheese Angela Merkel pushes for EU treaty change and European Union Court refers Deutsche Post state aid case back for review There's only one way to guarantee a vote on Europe and plus we are determined to make EU laws more business friendly I'm Rick Timmis, and this is the Unit Nightly News. First, from our homepage. The village of Stilton has been banned from making its namesake cheese after EU officials ruled it originated in another part of England. Under European law, the renowned blue cheese can only be produced in Leicestershire, Derbyshire and Nottinghamshire. Controversy arose when the Bells Inn in Stilton, Cambridgeshire, announced it wished to name their own blue-veined cheese after the village, rather than Bells Blue, which they have been forced to do. The kleptocrats have lost the plot again, I see. What does it matter whether it's called Stilton, Schmilton, Filton, Green or Sky Blue Pink? It's cheese! Cheese! This is nothing more than protectionism. Such legislation is in place to stop others from making a competing product. It might be, on the face of it, it might seem trivial, but really it isn't, because this is being applied to products and manufacturers of everything, from organic face cream to red wine and cheese. This cheese ruling... Well, frankly, it stinks. Angela Merkel is pushing for treaty change to give the European Union new powers to enforce Eurozone rules, opening the door for David Cameron to repatriate decision-making from Brussels back to Westminster. The German Chancellor is pushing for a new European Union blueprint to tidy up a cobweb of eurozone fiscal rules that have been agreed on a piecemeal basis since the debt crisis first threatened Europe's single currency three years ago. Now central to her fiscal union master plan will be new EU powers to enforce contracts set at the eurozone level to dictate national budgets and to bind countries such as France to promises to carry out economic reforms. Hmm, hang on a minute. Merkel's strategy in this piece is to introduce a new treaty with greater power drawn to the centre, not less. So if Chairman Cameron believes for one second that that will result in more power returned to the UK, then he's been at the funny mushrooms again. Look, folks, this is a charade. We're being lied to. Cameron has no intention of bringing back governance to Westminster. But most to the point, in stating that intention, he's openly admitting that powers of governance have already been given away. Well, if that's true, then we want to know who gave those powers away and when, because that is vital evidence in support of the case for treason. I'm sorry, but I've got very convinced that there is a case for treason by persons at the highest level in government, and I think we should be looking to pursue it. The European Court of Justice said on Thursday it was asking the European Union's second highest court to review its 2011 decision to reject a challenge by Deutsche Post DHL against the reopening of a probe into possible state aid. Deutsche Post, Europe's biggest mail and express delivery company, had tried to have shut down an investigation the EU Commission started in 2007. But the General Court of the EU said in late 2011 that the challenge was inadmissible because the investigation really related to a probe that has been going on for 12 years. So, now you know how and why the UK Post Office got split up, shut down, sold off and privatised. Another brick in the wall to construct the new federal nation-state of Europe. What makes this stick in the throat even further is that UK Parcel Force, the profitable arm of the post office, was directly attacked in a price marketing war by DHL. And who are DHL? Well, they're Deutsche Post, who whilst yet unproven were also being illegally aided by the state. So let's strip that back to bare facts for a moment. That means that the German and British governments 
both being challenged by the EU over national infrastructure, reacted in different ways. The UK shut its post office and obeyed the mandate for the dictators in Brussels. But the Germans used it as leverage to carve out a big fat slice of UK national infrastructure for themselves. Well, I'm beginning to see clearly how this war is being waged. It is not on the battlefield that we have lost, it is on the balance sheet. It was one of the defining speeches of the generation, that apparently unscripted speech by the then 30-something David Cameron to the Conservative Party conference in 2005, which in a mere 23 minutes secured him the leadership of his party. Cameron dealt with the EU question in short order. Yes, Europe was important, he conceded. It's just that the public really do wish we'd stop banging on about it. But what would Mr Cameron say today? He is, after all, committed to allowing the electorate, should they give him the necessary mandate, to decide whether they must remain bemeared in perpetuity in the folly that is the European Union. So how, for instance, would Cameron address the old canard that leaving the EU would mean exclusion from EU markets? Well, how about this? Those 10,000 trucks a day coming in from the continent, bringing goods into this country, well, they won't stop coming. The 25 to 35 billion pound trade surplus the rest of Europe runs with us, that's not going to stop. The idea that e the EU will start a trade war with Britain is simply not credible. And the real reason the EU won't be able or willing to stop trading with us is that the German car industry won't allow it. I just can't see Mrs Merkel explaining to Mercedes that they're not going to be selling into Britain anymore. With economic opportunities and societal problems cutting across borders, many political solutions must transcend national frontiers. But at present, a lot of people and businesses feel uncomfortable with the European Union, which they suspect generates too much red tape and interferes when it does not have to. We at the European Commission are determined to address these concerns. Right. <laughs> well, first off, businesses in Britain don't suspect that the EU generates too much red tape. We're convinced of it. In fact, we're weighed down by it, so much so that this one issue is a key plank of the Federation of Small Businesses. But let's not stop there, however. Next up, we at the Commission. What the hell has it got to do with you, 28 retarded appointees, who probably never seen the inside of a business in your lives? You are the problem, not the solution, and here's why. As a small group of 28 individuals who are appointed, not elected, you have already subverted the democratic process. In being the originators of legislative direction, you expose yourselves to infiltration and manipulation at the highest levels. Corporations will spend fortunes to misguide your ideas and pervert your thinking. How do I know? Because I have stood and watched them do it. Brussels, 2002. I was asked to speak to the European Commission on the use of open source software in business and enterprise in support of a high-level white paper written on the topic by Rishab Ghosh. In that presentation room were two barristers, one from Microsoft and the other from Sun Microsystems. Their job was simple. It was to counter every statement and misdirect the proceedings. And that, my friends, is how it's done. And the reason it works is because the Commission has higher authority than the Parliament. And that, folks, is why the European Union has, and always will, failed to deliver democratic governance from the people of Europe. It cannot be reformed. If you, and by you I mean the people of Europe, want a single European nation, then by all means build it. But it must be representative, and it must be democratic. Today in our video library, well, George Haynes wrote to us about some problems he was having searching for us on Google. He wrote, I'm not particularly a computer expert, but I would like friends to subscribe to the unit on the web. However, I Google that and I do not get you. Please help. Well, George, you're absolutely right. And this is a problem for us. The term the unit is just too general for us to appear in the search results. However, here's the best way to get people right to our site using Google or another search engine. 
if you just tell your friends to search for the unit European Union. This will return our website, www.th-eu-nit, theunit.com, as the number one result. I hope this helps you, and thank you for helping us spread the word. Now, in today's video library, we have two videos for you. What is Erasmus? This first video demonstrates the possibilities that the Erasmus project opens up for young Europeans. And video two takes a look at how the European Union is using the Erasmus project to promote its own political agenda. Stuart Agnew, MEP, asks some tough questions in the European Parliament. Now these two pieces highlight the problem that has really surfaced for us here at the unit. We know that the EU is not democratic and that its structure is the poster child for future tyranny. The Commission exercises way too much power and the Parliament is completely ineffective. These strategies of politicising the education have been used before, during the coming of the Third Reich. There are some still alive today that remember those times and for them the similarities are all too clear. Certainly, my grandfather-in-law, Frank Beard, lived through those times, and he has said as much to me in the past. If we want the young people of Europe to share in its freedom and opportunity, and I think that we should, then we have an obligation to provide a balanced and effective democratic system for them to grow into also. I'm Rick Timmis, reporting for the Unit Nightly News. I'll see you soon. <laughs>